My lathe is starting to make some unhappy sound. This right here, this bearing, is starting to get kind of growly. It did it once in a while for the last year. But I noticed during the last project, it was constant. And it happens at low RPM, around 200 maybe revolutions per minute. Well, I should say it's more noticeable at lower RPM. So we're going to take it apart and see what's going on. And hopefully it's nothing major. So let's take this cover off. Now this is what the cover looks like. There's a hole at the bottom here that oil drains, goes through that low spot and feeds back into the headstock. That nut is what provides the, what you use to adjust the preload on the bearing and notice it's slit. So that once you get the load right, you tighten those screws and it prevents from backing out. Just gonna release that lock. That works. This is aluminum rod. Don't try it with a cold chisel or something hard. It's pretty rough. That, and that's the surface that uh, pushes on the bearing. There's a metal sticking out from threading. It should be uh, lapped before I put it back on. Hopefully you can see that hole right there is where the oil drains back into the headstock. Well, there are two holes and uh, the way they place the gasket, <laughs> they're covering up one of the holes. All right, now we need to take that, loosen that collar. There are two set screws on this and underneath these set screws, there are either brass or copper plugs. So the set screws don't mar up the thread. Now I gotta move the front cover. I'm pretty sure that does not come out unless the spindle comes out. So we have to remove this bar. So removed uh, two set screws. Well folks, it's getting stupider and stupider. Yes, stupider. This rod has to come out through the back because there's a plug. And in order for you to take that out, you have to completely remove the electrical box. Oh, come on! Yeah. I'd like to meet the guy who designed that. They could have just mounted the electrical box about one and a half inches lower, then you wouldn't have to deal with all that. But no. Uh, but let me show you how the oiling works and maybe that grit uh, contributed to ruining the bearing up here. So basically it splashes and hits the bottom of the lid and the oil ends up in this perimeter groove. And the oil just by gravity goes down the hole and lubricates the bearings. So the thought is any grit and stuff, chips or whatever in the oil, since it's supposed to be heavier than oil, would settle into the lower areas, lower spots, and the oil will continue on into lubricating the, the bearings. But when I opened it up, I found a lot of grit uh, everywhere, and I used the magnet to pick up a lot of it, but still a lot of them there which may or may not have contributed but you know I'm looking around and I'm finding a lot of other a lot of uh, other uh, areas let me see if I can zoom in see right those those are chips like from machining but these spindle bearings I don't think they can handle uh, chips and metal particles the size that I'm seeing. So what does that mean? 
I think I'm gonna have to disassemble everything. I think I'm gonna have to take it completely apart, clean everything like they should have done from the factory. Hey, welcome back. I finally got the spindle loose. This is taper roller bearing at the end of the spindle. So remember the chuck is on the right hand side. This is the end. And this fit on the spindle was pretty darn tight. You can actually see it was, um, I don't know if it's a press fit, but sure uh, felt like it. And uh, I tapped with, you know, mallet and everything it didn't work. What finally worked is I took a heat gun and heated the inner race. And I heated it maybe good 10 minutes. Anyway, it expanded it enough where I could hit the spindle with the mallet. One of these soft mallets. I mean, look at all those metal shavings. If you're a gold miner and you saw that, you'd be excited. Okay, here's the main spindle. This is the D14 spindle end. That's the drag mount size four. Let's see if that's enough. It's coming out. That's hot. It's cover. Spindle. I got everything removed from the headstock. It was a lot of work just trying to figure out which gear or which shaft for that matter needs to come out first before others can come out. And then there are numerous snap rings and uh, they just are a pain in the butt to try to get out. Anyway, it's empty and uh, it's just amazing how much crud is in there. Look at all that crud. And like I said, I've already changed the fluid before and uh, it just amazes me. No wonder the bearings uh, didn't last. I mean, look at that. I mean, that is quarter of an inch long metal chip from machining and they're everywhere. Not happy with it. All right, we're gonna start cleaning. I did uh, take paper towel and scoop out whatever the remaining oil uh, that, uh, there was and a lot of the gunk out of there. I did go ahead and clean the holes um, with alcohol and uh, we're just going to spray the inside with mineral spirit and we're going to brush it for now. We're trying to get any grit, big stuff that may uh, still be here. I'd say I'm gonna let this dry and vacuum out whatever I can and then we'll do another wash. But look at that. If and after two scrubs, here's a large metal chip. It's about a quarter inch of an inch long. 
when they machine created burrs on the exit side of those machines and there are burrs that are breaking off. So it looks like I'm gonna have to do some filing and deburring. Look at that, that one's about half of an inch, three eighths, half of an inch. Still fun. So I'll bring you back after I finish that. Well, this is how it looks after like four scrubbing sessions with mineral spirit. You can eat off of it actually, if you wanted to. Those uh, dark spots you see are just uh, flaws in painting, um, but it is really clean now. Got all the loose bits and everything cleaned off. And uh, before I start reassembling, um, I'll vacuum again. I vacuumed it twice, but uh, we'll vacuum again and blow everything out with uh, compressed air. I'm still waiting on more bearings to show up. So um, it's starting to look good. Another thing that I noticed is where they drilled and tapped holes. Uh, the surface had mush mushroomed up and uh, so when you touch it with a file it just it was there sticking out so the lid was not really sealing the top which uh, explains why I was having oil leakage through the top edges and just you know dripping down the side. So I filed that down. I chased all these holes re with a tap and, uh, you know, cleaned the holes out. They were filled with, uh, you know, machining grits and stuff. So cleaned all those things out so that would uh, seal better. And here is how it looks on the end here. The other side is where the chuck goes. So I ended up taking a stone and deburring all those outer edges because they were left sharp at the factory. So that'll be, uh, make it easier to drive the bearings in and clean all those holes out. They were filled with uh, grits and all that fun stuff too. This is the chuck end. That's the main spindle opening and a couple of little, uh, holes so you can uh, to help install the shafts and bearings and all that. And I did leave these shifter knobs because they just they don't do much. It's, I don't gain anything by taking those apart, so I left them on there. But they got thorough cleaning. Let's quickly look at how I got my parts organized. I stole my wife's craft table. I didn't want to get too oily, so I put some cardboard on there, but it also helps uh, keep things organized and things from rolling off the table. So um, I just used the labeling convention in the parts manual. I just took a marker and labeled the parts like B, A, S, E, D, C. That's how the manual has each sub-assemblies labeled. And I try to leave uh, things as sub-assemblies wherever, whenever it was possible. Um, it's really easy to forget how these things go together. So that way, as I need them, I'll disassemble and clean them and it'll be fresh in my mind as to how things came out. Before I started this project, I looked on YouTube and on the internet and there just isn't uh, good uh, informative videos or articles out there. So since I'm doing the job, I thought I would uh, kind of share uh, how I'm doing things. I'm not saying it's the best way, but it's just what I'm doing and it's worked so far. So here are some of the main tools that I, you know, I'm using. Obviously, you know, Allen's uh, wrenches and adjustable wrenches, screwdriver, those things I'm not including here because uh, I know you all have it. But the most important thing is 
the parts manual if you can find it. This is Jet, so you know it's pretty readily available, and uh, it tells you how things should uh, be assembled. For the most part, there are things that kind of made me scratch my head, but anyway, so you'll need a gear puller to pull the pulley and a heat gun. This is not a heavy duty heat gun, but uh, some of the bearings were uh, really tight in the headstock. So um, just heating uh, some of the areas helped uh, remove it a little easier. Now this thing right here is my version of a slide hammer. I didn't have a slide hammer and I went to purchase one, but nobody in town has them. So I did order one through Amazon, but it was, you know, take, it was going to take three, four days. So me being impatient, I just welded a correct size, uh, bolt to, uh, this cold roll steel and a vice grip and a big nut and, uh, the shafts in the headstock, some of them have, well, they all do, have uh, threaded holes. And that's generally the direction that shaft will come out. So I would thread that in there and hit it with a hammer on this. And I was able to remove all the shafts that I need. Now, if you have a shaft that has an opening on the opposite end, you can use something like this and a hammer to drive it out from inside. But uh, this worked rather well. And uh, of course a slide hammer arrived after the fact, but you know, that's all right. So let's talk about these. Now you do need to uh, drive some of the bearings and shafts out of there. And these are aluminum rods Obviously, you know, they're softer, so you don't damage uh, the shafts or, or bearings, even though I'm going to replace all the bearings. Now, um, they do mushroom and they do leave aluminum flakes in the headstock. So I wouldn't use it for reassembling, but for disassembly, when you're going to clean everything out, it works great and ball peen hammer obviously what's really important is that you have decent set of snap ring gauges this is your cheapy just flimsy works okay if you have a small snap rings this is a step up with interchangeable tips they are also okay you can buy them from all different brands, but they're okay. Uh, these flex, which is not good because you want them to be pointing in whichever direction, depending on whether it is an internal or external snap ring. But, you know, they work okay. Now, I did splurge and get myself uh, Nipex German-made snap uh, ring pliers inside and outside these are awesome they're properly angled the tips are properly angled and the tips are made of you know forged steel uh, german made what can i say they're really awesome uh, of course i can't find any of these locally so uh amazon good place i think these were like 23 dollars each they're not the cheapest but they're something that'll last you for the rest of your life and your kids. Now these bees, one's for internal and one's for external. You need them to remove the big uh, snap rings that are on the main spindle. These are also um, something you really can't find and typically don't find locally. So Amazon, these are OTC brand made in Taiwan. Um, again, 
they're not cheap. They're 80 bucks for a pair with uh, interchangeable tips in a case uh, from Amazon. But again, when you need them, you need them. There's nothing you can do about it. And uh, they're high enough quality that your kids will enjoy it. Here's a bearing I pulled out of the spindle. This is the one that goes at the chuck end. The rollers are pretty well damaged. And the uh, outer race, it's damaged. It should be shiny all the way across. You can see pits starting to develop. And, and it looks like it definitely chewed through some foreign material. Now, Jet wanted almost $700 for the replacement bearing, just like this one, Chinese made. But I was able to find Japanese made NSK bearing same size with same P5 grade from none other than Grizzly. One of their 14 by 40 lathe uses this bearing and they have it available as a replacement part. Now you can find this bearing number 30212 anywhere for around $30. But what makes this special is the P rating. P is one of the uh, classification system used to identify the precision of bearing and this one happens to be P5 grade that is very precise so I paid $120 plus shipping and handling and uh, about $145 I had it in two days this is a smaller bearing on the spindle you can also see the rollers are heavily damaged and the outer race is also damaged. You can see some sharp rings as if it drug some foreign material through it. Not to mention dull center section. For this replacement, Jet wanted almost $600 for the same Chinese made bearing. Fortunately, I was able to locate this Japanese NTN bearing with same P5 precision grade from a dealer in Netherlands. For the price of the bearing and three day shipping and taxes, I paid about $95. $240 versus almost $1,300 from Jet, and I have much nicer Japanese bearings. As far as other bearings that go on counter shafts, there are 14 of them. And I did order them all, uh, either SKF or NTN, and they should be made in Japan or USA. Uh, I've received some, but the rest of them are out another week. On those, I decided to use normal clearance versus more commonly available C3. Uh, C3 basically means it has additional clearance so that if the application causes a heat buildup, the balls have additional clearance to expand to. In my case, that's not really an issue. I have a headstock full of oil, so CN, aka normal clearance, would be a better fit for my application. And for those 14 bearings, all made in USA or Japan, I have about $250 invested. So total, all the bearings will cost me shipping and taxes included around $500. Now that's a lot of money, but actually that is pretty good deal given that you'd be well around $2,000 if you were to go to uh, your the jet or other sources. So I feel pretty good about it. It's one of those things where, you know, having a lathe with bad bearings, it just doesn't do me a whole lot of good. So you sometimes have to pay to play I guess. We're still waiting on eight or nine bearings to uh, arrive. It'll be another week I think so why don't we end this video right here. The second part will be reassembly and testing. Maybe while I wait I'll get myself another haircut or something so who knows. Please like comment and subscribe and thanks for watching.